Welcome to the presentation on Wildlife Friendlier Roads, presented to you by the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program Guyana, or SWM for short. SWM is an initiative by the Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific Group of States, and is being funded by the European Union, with co-funding from the French Global Environment Facility. In Guyana, one of 13 participating countries, the program is implemented by the Wildlife Conservation and Management Commission, also known as the Wildlife Commission, and C4, the Center for International Forestry Research. The Guyana program aims to achieve sustainable management of fish and terrestrial wildlife, enhancement of local livelihoods through activities that support sustainable wildlife management, well-trained, critical stakeholders in wildlife for sustainable management, and availability of the knowledge required to make informed decisions for sustainable wildlife management. Why are roads part of this program? Roads are important for people to access education, healthcare, and markets, and as such, Roads support the development of people and nations. Roads can thus play an important role in helping us achieve many of the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs, which nations worldwide have agreed upon to work towards. The foundation of these goals, however, is formed by the biosphere, and it is important to ensure that the values of the biosphere are not compromised in achieving the other goals. Furthermore, Wildlife offers benefits to people through ecological, cultural, and positive livelihood values. Roads can be one of the major drivers of species declines when they are not well constructed or poorly managed. Therefore, roads that are built in a wildlife-friendly manner can help ensure positive progress towards the sustainable development goals. With limited negative feedback between them. Moreover, Wildlife-friendly roads may support activities that assist with sustainable wildlife management, such as ecotourism, access to alternative food sources, or markets for local products that support local livelihoods. In recent years, we have come to understand much more about roads in relation to wildlife, although much of this knowledge has focused on countries and temperate zones. SWM incorporated this recent knowledge in a new approach to evaluate and predict road impacts and to prioritize actions that help prevent these during the construction phase. This project is the first to implement this integrated method. What will you learn in this presentation? Through an example from Region 9 in Guyana, we present a landscape level methodology for the assessment of road impacts on wildlife and the prioritization of mitigation measures that can be incorporated at limited or no additional cost during the construction phase of the road. Our project provides detailed examples of what works and what doesn't by zooming in on a section of the Georgetown Latham Road between Sarama and Latham and the Latham I Shelton Road in Region 9. The results can be applied directly to any upgrades of these road sections. But, the methods presented here could also be easily adapted to other roads, or even to broader land use planning. When the themes of wildlife and roads are discussed jointly, there are two main images that appear in people's mind. Large and costly overpasses. And roadkill. Another common association is the use of road signs. First, the absence of roadkill does not mean there is no problem. Think, for example, about a road in a big city. You will likely not find a dead wild animal there. Why do you think that is? We will come back to this in the next slide. Road signs, typically targeted to reduce roadkill, may be part of an awareness program. But in terms of reducing negative impact on wildlife, they're inefficient. Who reduces speed for a sign alone? 
The overpasses, on the other hand, can be very efficient. But the downside is the extremely high cost, which severely limits the number of passes that can be built. And therefore, their relative contribution in a large natural landscape is also insufficient. They are also post hoc solutions, built when a major issue has already been discovered. The method we present will help achieve efficient, proactive and therefore cost-efficient strategies. Let us first dive into a brief overview on general impacts roads may have on wildlife. First, effects of the road occur in two stages, the construction phase and the user phase. We will focus on the latter because it covers effects of both. Additionally, we can distinguish direct and indirect impacts. Direct impacts result from the road presence itself, and they include habitat loss in the road corridor, pollution through dust or fumes, but also noise and light, mortality through roadkill, and the barrier effect, where the road separates individuals of a species into smaller subgroups. Indirect impacts, on the other hand, result from activities that are facilitated by the presence of the road, such as further road network expansion, new human settlements, resource extraction, agriculture, and access for hunters and poachers. These activities, in turn, augment the direct impacts the road already had. While indirect impacts can be addressed through management practices, direct impacts can, to a certain extent, be mitigated through smart construction. And that is what we are focused on here. Let us take a closer look at direct impacts and ensure that there is no misconception before continuing. Oftentimes, the biggest concern people have regarding this theme is roadkill. But, as we hinted at earlier, roadkill is not typically the real issue. It only becomes a problem for certain species when the number of individuals being run over is high compared to the local population size. And, of course, if collisions could cause accidents with risks for people. A much bigger issue arises when wildlife cannot cross the road at all, either because of structural barriers or because of the species ecology that prevents it from approaching or crossing the road surface. Animals are adapted to a specific environment and the road is oftentimes too different from this habitat. The barrier effect is particularly worrisome because it can cause rapid declines and local extinction but also because it is not as visible as the other impacts and harder to document. Our method offers a solution permitting to consider this impact as well. Next, let us look at our local project and what we did exactly. We combined field work with a desktop analysis. While the fieldwork component was important for us in the development of the method, this part can be reduced or even skipped when applying the method in environments with similar species communities. For the field component, we recorded roadkill during two months in a dry season in early 2019. We took note of species, location and time. We also recorded traffic volume as this affects a number and type of roadkill we could expect to find. Roadkill is not necessarily an indication of an important crossing point, because it suggests a location where crossing was not successful. To interpret the information, we needed to dive deeper into species ecology. And we will come back to this. We also collected information on live sightings of wildlife on the road, which indicates successful crossings. Lastly, we evaluated existing bridges and culverts, which could serve as underpasses for wildlife and are key to the solutions we present. 
to be able to interpret the field data in the correct context and to develop a more widely applicable method, we conducted the desktop analysis, which consisted of a species evaluation and a spatial analysis, as we'll explain in the next few slides. For the desktop analysis, we first selected priority species based on existing information of local species communities, their conservation status, and importance for local culture and livelihoods, for example, tourism or hunting. For more details on this process, we refer to the report available from the SWM Guyana office. What is important here is that we assess the response of these species to the road and categorize them. These categories were non-responders, pausers, speeders, avoiders, and opportunists. Furthermore, we assigned a habitat category, indicating whether they were generalist or specialist that required specific features for movement, such as water or tree canopies. This categorization was based on a method described by Jacobson in 2016 and permits a simplified systematic approach to road solutions. Because species belonging to a specific group in this classification will have similar structural needs to prevent roadkill or barrier effects. Next, we developed a spatial model to predict where these species would be moving through the landscape, and there's also where we would expect them to be crossing the road. The analysis included the following attributes. Land cover and land use, distance to forest, distance to forest loss, distance to water bodies, and slope. Depending on the species, these attributes were given weights. The weights determine how important the attribute is for the species to be able to move through the landscape. For example, a giant otter would have a high weight for the attribute distance to water, while a bush deer would have a lower weight for water, but a higher weight for distance to forest. We also assign scores of 0 to 100 to the categories within these attributes to indicate the level of hindrance this would cause for the movement of the species. To go back to the giant river otter, the category of more than a thousand meters away from water would receive a high score, indicating high hindrance or difficult movement, whereas the deer would still receive a comparatively low score, low hindrance for that category because it is less restricted by water in its daily movements. Now, what did our study find? As predicted by our desktop analysis, we found limited numbers of roadkill, and the majority of species were those attracted to the road, the opportunists. Wildlife appeared to be crossing mostly before 8 a.m., when traffic volume was also lowest, suggesting they are adapting to human activity, as is also seen elsewhere. There are roadkill hotspots associated with higher quality habitat, and comparison with an earlier study hints at the possibility of seasonal patterns, which needs further investigation. With changes in road surface, road width, and particularly in traffic volume, we expect to see increases in roadkill numbers and shifts in species. At this point, the biggest concern for roadkill in case of a road upgrade is for giant anteaters and turtles. For other species, including aquatic species and large mammals, such as jaguar and sapir, the barrier effect needs addressing. The maps you see here are based on our spatial analysis of 17 priority species. On the left, you see the North Rupununi. On the right, the South Rupununi of Region 9 in Guyana. The darkest green represents high quality habitat for terrestrial species, constituting stretches of forest that measure more than 2,500 square kilometers. Presence and movement in these patches was considered to be affected only by seasonal and microhabitat factors that cannot easily be mapped, such as fruiting trees. 
we assume general presence of wildlife across these patches. In the rest of the maps, bright red indicates easy passage and therefore high probability of the species occurring there and moving through this area. Yellow to light green means low probability of passage. Based on this map, we identified key potential crossing points, where the bright red crosses the road. To give you an idea of how well this type of model works, we plotted the live sightings of giant anteaters from the study in early 2019 on the map. Those are the white points. You can see that these points correspond very well with the identified movement areas, the bright red zones. Note that this same zone was also a high road mortality spot, although not for giant anteaters at this point. With increased traffic, however, this will be more of a concern. We are currently doing some more work to test the accuracy and precision of the models, which were based on expert knowledge requiring only basic ecological information. The anteater data, however, show promising results. Let us fast forward to potential mitigation measures at the identified crossing sites. Bridges and culverts are necessary components of roads, and with water and its associated habitat being so important for wildlife, these structures can offer great passages for many species at their crossing sites. If built well, they can help prevent roadkill, and importantly, they can help limit barrier effects. Therefore, in the final step, we turn to the evaluation of bridges and culverts. This evaluation offers, first, great examples of what wildlife-friendly underpasses look like, and second, for the roads in question, it tells us what kind of improvements should be considered when these bridges are upgraded and what characteristics they currently have that should be maintained. We map the bridges, plotted them onto the road crossing heat maps for different categories of species, and as such, prioritized which bridges could be serving as underpasses for our species categories and what characteristics they required. For example, a very low bridge where only small species are expected to pass does not need to be raised. But if it happens to be in a deer crossing, the dimensions become more important. One of the main issues with most bridges is that they are too narrow and water hits the wings of the bridge. This causes several issues. First, it limits terrestrial wildlife movements for lack of dry area. Second, it causes erosion, resulting in water pollution. Third, this affects water flow characteristics, which together with the second issue affects aquatic species. Fourth, this results in rapid damage to the structure, therefore potentially endangering people driving across. Wildlife-friendly roads are also people-friendly roads. Let us look at a few examples of good and bad structures. On the left, you see an example of the issue described earlier, where the water hits the wings. Additionally, construction debris hinders passage. On the right, we see an example of a wildlife-friendly bridge. Its height permits passage of all sizes of wildlife in the area, water flows freely, protecting the natural habitat for aquatic species, a sufficiently large dry area is available underneath the bridge, and there is some natural vegetation that would promote wildlife movements. In this next slide, take a moment to observe other wildlife solutions on the right and their poor counterparts on the left. Looking at the road in our study between Sarama and Latham, about 138 kilometers, there were 19 bridges. And of these, eight resulted as important for wildlife movements as identified with the accumulated spatial model. 
Pictures of most of these important bridges are shown here. Of these, several were built rather well. But the bridges shown with orange frames all required lengthening and removal of debris. Ginnip, identified as a crossing for savannah deer, would best be built higher up. Note in the pictures of the forest bridges how the water hits the sides. This is during the dry season when the water is still low, and therefore this causes year-round issues. For the second road in our study, in the South Rupununi between Lethem and Aishelton, our analysis identified 5 to 6 important bridges out of 22 total. Except for the small Rupununi bridge, which needed lengthening, all were fine. Imatawo was under construction at the time and could not be evaluated. In the south, there were also important wildlife crossing areas with only culverts, of which our analysis indicated a need for conversion to bridges during an upgrade. The two areas, south of the village Shulanap and south of Sawarawo Creek, are indicated in the map with the white arrows. For more than 300 kilometers of road, we identified these priority sites for terrestrial wildlife, offering specific recommendations for where bridges are needed and what standards these structures should meet. Aside from bridges and culverts as wildlife underpasses, other considerations will improve the wildlife friendliness of roads. Some of these can be directly supported through the model we presented. The specific road alignment. Steering clear of high wildlife movement areas where possible. They should also consider sensitive habitats, such as wetlands. Next, because the effects are not limited to the road corridor, a dense road network quickly leads to a lack of suitable habitat, even if there is still natural habitat in the mix. Road density is a key consideration. The graphic illustrates this phenomenon. The black lines represent roads. Arrows indicate distance of road impact. Green represents remaining suitable habitat. If an additional road were to be built in the center of this area, suitable habitat would decrease substantially. If after that another road were to be added, no suitable habitat would remain, even if natural vegetation were left in between the roads. Also, the height of the road can prevent wildlife from crossing, which is typically not good but in some cases, this can function as a guide for animals towards bridges where the animals can cross safely, provided these bridges follow the guidelines for wildlife-friendly underpasses. But, for aquatic species, this is not ideal. And particularly in a wetland, water flow must be considered. All these factors can be addressed at the planning and construction phase of the road. As mentioned at the start of the presentation, road use management is important too, and must be considered. Hunting along the road can cause even the best built road to become a barrier, when rather than vehicles, the hunters cause excessive mortality. The solution? Hunting zones away from roads and definitely far from animal crossing points. Development alongside the road reduces probability of wildlife approaching and crossing the road even with good bridges. The solution? Development planning with restrictions near key crossing sites. Nighttime activity at crossing points, including bridges, can increase the barrier effect, even for well-built roads. The solution? Consider nighttime traffic restrictions, particularly in or near protected areas or in sensitive habitat. These factors cannot be addressed through construction, but rather require smart management practices. We showed you an example of a method where we evaluated potential impacts of roads on wildlife 
and through which we prioritize locations where specific actions can be taken to help reduce this impact. This method has several advantages. First, it is based on limited data, consisting of general information on which species occur in the region, what their importance is, for example, conservation status and local value for tourism or hunting, and what their general habitat needs are. This general information is available for many species. Second, the evaluation method is comparatively low cost because it is based on existing knowledge and requires spatial layers for mapping that are freely available online or that can be sourced from government agencies. Third, the recommendations, when considered at the construction phase of the road itself or of its components, such as bridges and culverts, require limited or no additional investments. And following the recommendations, post-construction costs will be reduced in terms of maintenance costs and ecological impact that may affect tourism, local livelihoods, and ecosystem services. Last but not least, the application of this type of study is not only limited to road network planning and construction, but can be extended to help provide support when making land use and zoning decisions. Concrete lasts 50 to 100 years. And if done inconsiderately, this construction can have long-lasting negative impacts on wildlife and on people. We offered a simple tool to help build wildlife-friendlier roads. We give special thanks to the road team for collecting the data. Thank you very much for your attention. Should you have further questions, please contact the Guyana SWM office.